May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder if you've ever had anyone tell you that they are praying for you. The likelihood is that we've all had people pray for us, but it's somehow quite different when they tell us that they're going to do so. It might happen when we're going through a difficult time with health, job or family. It can make us feel uneasy and maybe a bit vulnerable. But there's also a feeling of well-being because we know we're not alone. We know that someone cares for us and we know that God is there in the midst of it all. Sometimes that prayer happens in our presence. And to hear someone pray for you has added power because those concerns are brought into the presence of God and we should feel healing and release. And we maybe get a nice comfortable and comforting glow. This morning we're now three days on from the Ascension. But our Gospel reading took us back to Maundy Thursday, and what a day that was. The preparations in the upper room for the Last Supper, the foot washing, the institution of Holy Communion, and then Judas slipping out to betray his Master. And then at the end of supper, Jesus preaching his farewell discourse, and that is covered in chapters 14 to 17 of John's Gospel. <coughs> Chapter 17 is known as the High Priestly Prayer, and part of that we heard this morning. It's a passage of real revelation, described by Archbishop William Temple as probably the most sacred passage in all of the Gospels. If last week's Gospel could be likened to Jesus talking to his loved ones, knowing that he was soon to die. This week we can almost say that the Gospel could be called his last will and testament, because it's Jesus praying to the Father for his disciples and asking for various requests on their and, of course, our behalf. The prayer is composed of a series of reports that Jesus makes to his Father about his mission, now completed, and a series of petitions for God's care of the community to be left behind. And in it, the reports and the petitions are interwoven. His primary concern is the ongoing life of the Christian community. And Jesus prays for at least four things. That the community be protected from evil, that it be unified, that it, be, that it fulfill Jesus' love, and that the life of the church be distinct from the life of the world. A reminder here, perhaps, for all those who in an attempt to make the church more appealing and to attract those who don't come, we should have the church succumb to the premise that if society thinks it's all right, then we should follow. Not so. One of our prime responsibilities in the church is to attempt to discern the will of God in all things, and certainly not to follow blindly where society leads. And in many ways, it is the duty of the church to be counter-cultural. But to return to today's Gospel and the prayer that Jesus was making to his Father. This was the Son of God who is praying, the one who came to save the world, including us. He died for us. And he's now praying for our safety, praying for our souls. This is the one who has power over evil and death itself, 
but he's praying for us. And Jesus is the one who sends us out to carry on all that was important for him. This intimate, one-way conversation from son to father gives us the image that Jesus had of his followers and the image he has of us now. Although Gospel writers, commentators and others depict Jesus' disciples as clueless and bumbling, we hear Jesus affirm them. They know the truth as I came from you. He lifts them up. They do not belong to this world. And tells us that they were worthy companions on the journey. They have kept your word. And although it is an intimate prayer of Jesus to his Father, it is one that was intended to be overheard, so that the hearers would know that they would not be forgotten, and that they were affirmed, and to be assured of his continuing love for them. And this prayer of Jesus is all about his followers today. It's not just limited to first century disciples. We still need protection from the evil one. We still need encouragement for the work that we do in the world. In our struggle to preach Christ crucified in a society so blinded by material wealth at any cost and so enamoured of creature comforts, it is this prayer on our behalf that invokes the Holy Spirit. When we hear Jesus pray this prayer for us, it is a foretaste of the Feast of Pentecost, now only a week away. We need to remember that Jesus is praying for us. He wants us to live as children of God and promises to give us the strength to face whatever comes. We also need to remember to pray for those around us and for those far away. Pray that we and they will be protected in our faith and that we will be sanctified, even if that means that we will need the courage to stand out and be different in a material world. Indeed, to know that Christ prayed for me, for us, gives us strength when we thought we were spent, success when we thought we were failures, and vision to see transformation when we thought none was possible. We are never alone, a warm thought indeed for us to hang on to, especially at those times when we think we're on our own. We're not.